Good morning. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining Grenzebach, Blair & Associates for the third webinar in our Fundraising in a Public Health Crisis Thought Leadership Series. My name is John Glear, and I'm the Chief Executive of Grenzebach, Glear & Associates. I would like to first welcome our very special guest today, Rhea Turtletaub, the Vice Chancellor of External Affairs at the University of California, Los Angeles. Rhea has happily agreed to join us today and share with us how she and her team at UCLA have been working through the challenging events of the last few weeks. First, uh, let me say a few words about Rhea's background. Rhea appointed to her current role in 2008. She serves as the vice chancellor of an extraordinarily diverse organization spanning development, alumni affairs, government and community relations, and advancement services, as well as serving as a key leader in the UCLA Alumni Association and the UCLA Foundation. Rhea leads an organization of over 600 staff professionals that among many tasks and challenges, help generate across the university over $700 million a year in philanthropic support for UCLA's many educational, clinical, research, and service initiatives. We should note that UCLA has just completed its third comprehensive fundraising campaign, celebrating the university's centennial. The campaign came to closure on December 31st, 2019, a few short months ago, and raised $5.49 billion, substantially eclipsing its original $4.2 billion goal. The campaign secured 574,000 gifts from over 220,000 donors from all 50 states and 98 countries around the world. Many of you know UCLA as a very distinguished research university, but let me remind you that it is a community of over 45,000 students 500,000 alumni worldwide, an $8 billion uh, budget that includes an extraordinary medical center in the heart of Los Angeles, and currently close to a $6 billion uh, endowment. Rhea came to UCLA nearly 26 years ago after leadership roles at the University of Chicago, the University of California, Berkeley, she began her advancement career at her alma mater, Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, where she currently serves on its board of directors. Welcome this morning, Rhea. And thank, thank you. Thank you, being John. Here. Great. Thank you, now, John. It's great. It's nice to be here from my living room office. <laughs> as we all are right now. <laughs> now, let me, as we get started, for everybody out there with us, let me remind you that our conversation with Rhea will go approximately 25 minutes right to 1130. We warmly welcome questions for Rhea from any of our listeners. However, unfortunately, we will not be able to take those questions live on the air. We would ask you instead to please direct them to the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Rhea has graciously agreed to try to address any questions set in sent in. It may take a few days, but we are committed to publishing on our website both your submitted questions and Rhea's answers. So let me remind you all that you are on uh, mute as we go forward. So let me begin. Um, I think, Rhea, as you know, we have uh, almost 1,400 colleagues in the profession who tuned in to this session. We want to thank you for being for joining us today, and trust that uh, um, this will, in fact, allow us to cover a number of questions that um, I think uh, are important to you. So let me begin by asking a question a bit about how UCLA and how you and your academic and program leaders across UCLA's campus and its many different program and project sites began to respond to this COVID-19 crisis. How quickly did the campus close? How has the transition to online, online teaching moved forward? And especially, how has UCLA Health Sciences mobilized to respond to the crisis? 
Well, let, let me start, John, by saying that, as we all realize, this is such an unprecedented time. And the processes by which we as a leadership team um, and many organizations across the country and around the globe have been engaging in these conversations, we are all flying in some respects a little blind. There is no precedent for this. And yet, um, there is an extraordinary amount of scientific research and data that has been guiding a lot of very, very important conversations. And what I can tell you is that as a leadership team at UCLA, we began effectively daily meetings of the campus leaders with the chancellor and our executive vice chancellor beginning in the first week of March, um, March 2nd, in fact. And those daily conversations stretch two hours. Um, we're guided in many aspects of the decision making and have been um, by the leadership of our health system, Dr. John Maziata, who is a part of that leadership team, um, and our Dean of Public Health, and uh, Ron Brookmeyer, and the people who have been entrusted to make decisions for the university have some of the very best resources on the campus. And to be able to be blessed with that level of expertise has been really helpful. That said, the conversation and the leadership discussions taking place and on my calendar, I went back to, to March 2nd, the chancellor has, has communicated with the campus community 10 times between March 2nd and March 20th. The campus did not formally close, but for essential services, until the 20th of March. But we have been talking about this as a leadership team since the 2nd, um, and there's obviously people in the health environment who have been watching this for months around the world. And uh, we were guided by a lot of their best recommendations as well as those throughout the UC system. The health leaders throughout the UC system have been in conversation for quite some time. But the way in which the discussions about how we were going to transition the campus evolved in real time. I think we've all felt that, um, seemingly almost hour to hour on some days. So as early as March 2nd, there were health reminders that went out about how to stay safe and good hygiene practices, and there's no need to cancel any activities. Meanwhile, we had an academic continuity task force working on what it would mean in the event we might reach a stage where we'd have to transition to remote learning. And so those plans, the fact that that group was meeting was in, that were announced on March 4th. Um, people were working to expand the capability to move learning uh, remotely, but we hadn't moved there yet. Then on March 6th, we learned that the first group of students was announced were being tested. And that of course sent a group of, um, you know, a, a level of anxiety around the campus and then we learned later that night that the students tested negative and were able to announce that. But as we were talking about reducing density and creating that sense of physical distancing that everybody was talking about to flatten the curve, you know, all these new terms in our, in our vocabulary now, um, we began talking about classrooms and how important it was to create distancing in classrooms that could be of three and 400. And eventually we started talking about the residence halls. And because I sit at our leadership team with a student who's in our freshman class and have been inside those dorms where we have three students occupying a space that was built for two and effectively 15,000 of them in one residential area, we began instead shifting from the classroom to talking about what does it mean to have effectively a cruise ship stable on our campus and the density in the residence halls is what we really had to focus on as well, not just the classroom. And so by the uh, 10th of March, it became very clear that we needed to transition to online, uh, to remote 
without learning. And so that then began a, uh, a slow first exodus from the campus. We were still three days into our quarter, or remaining in our quarter, and we had exams, the, the, uh, the final exams coming up the next week. All of that transitioned to an online environment on the 10th. And on the 13th, our chancellor announced that he was self-quarantining self because he had been exposed to someone who had tested positive uh, earlier that week. So in rapid succession, in just 11 days, uh, we moved from let's be safe about our hygiene practices and let's not travel to countries that our State Department says are level three countries to quickly shifting uh, to a remote environment. And we did not close formally um, until, as I said, the 20th, when our mayor and then the governor on the evening of the 19th issued the, as our, as our mayor likes to say, safer at home orders. And we still obviously have essential services. We still have students on campus, those who can't go home, um, those who are safer on campus, but we have very, very reduced operations. We're servicing our students who are there, helping faculty transition to this online uh, and remote learning, learning environment. And obviously our healthcare enterprise, our health, the UCLA health system is fervently at work. Uh, they've been preparing for some time but the work that they are doing, it, it is no understatement to say that this work is heroic for our frontline healthcare workers. And they are mobilizing with the most incredible and inspirational amount of creativity. Because as I like to say, in many respects, all across the country, people are working with almost two hands tied behind their back. Yeah. Um, so given that's the quite- Supply chain issues and- So that's just, quite- a Extraordinary, Rhea. Um, let's turn now um, for a moment and talk about explicitly your colleagues in external affairs right. who sit in the middle of this and have watched the campus evolve as you've just described. How have they pivoted towards this new on, online reality working remotely? What were some of their challenges in moving such a large advancement enterprise to a new way of working? And how's it going so far? Well, once we knew that the campus, we could anticipate that the campus was going to be moving to a remote learning environment, I would say it was the second week of March when we tasked all of our managers to begin assessing what would be needed to move to remote work. Because as essential as our work is in helping support the campus, we talked about the importance of recognizing that our physical location was not essential and that we could do our part to help reduce density and even in our own environment, flatten the curve, uh, to start by uh, doing remote work as early as the 16th. That's when we moved. In the afternoon of the 13th, we announced that we were moving to a remote or telecommuting environment because that entire week we had spent with our managers assessing what the needs were, who already was capable of working from home, who could if only provided certain equipment. Um, we had a whole checklist of things that we needed and we had uh, the head of our HR environment, Carol Fister, helping us in gathering all this information. Uh, we well, said were there any particular challenges you didn't expect to encounter as you went through this process, Rhea? Well, you know, we, we certainly needed equipment for a, lot, for a number of people. And um, uh, my colleague, Julie Sina, who heads up our Alumni Affairs and Advancement Services Program, found out that we could very quickly order uh, a large group of laptops. We ordered 50 laptops that week so that we would have the opportunity to distribute those to those who didn't have that capability at home. Um, we've certainly, as we've begun all of this, in, we're now two weeks into our telecommuting, and a lot of those laptops 
in our attempt to use Zoom meetings as often as possible, a lot of those laptops aren't equipped very well with microphones. And so we've got people juggling multiple devices so that they can see each other as well as speak to one another. Um, helping people first even get accustomed to the fact of working at home is its own challenge, but we also have to remember that the Los Angeles Unified School District closed as well, and so many, many people were dealing with childcare issues. And so we gave the first few days uh, to folks to sort of figure out just their, their work and home life in general and how to manage uh, without the childcare or the, or the classroom environments that their children typically were in. And so balancing all of these things, we talk a lot about work-life balance and colleagues on the, on the line here who are listening who know me know that I say it's never really possible to find that on any given day. Well, that, that is being tested in so many ways right now um, with children that want our attention, with family that need our attention, with the challenges and the anxieties. So you know, we, have, we have the technical capability of being connected. It doesn't always work as perfectly as we'd like, but we also have found ways to adapt and be flexible. And I think over time, all of this will get refined. And I definitely see differences in week two than from week one. And um, we're making it work. So you know? Rhea, that sounds like it, it resonates with a lot of what we're hearing around the country, uh, including the work-life balance you raise and, and, and actually encountering uh, equipment challenges because we didn't quite anticipate what we were, what we were really um, uh, trying to do here. Um, let me shift for a minute to the management challenges that all of this implies. Uh, let me ask you how you and uh, your other members of the leadership team stay connected, stay aligned, given how quickly things have moved, and, and how is your own external leadership affairs leadership team managing remotely? What tools do they use, and how do your staff leaders uh, really build meetings with their own teams, and how often? Okay, so that's a great question. So, so first of all, we all should have bought stock in Zoom when it was a dollar. Um, we are relying heavily on that in our environment. So our leadership team, that's the chancellor and our chief academic officer, um, our executive vice chancellor and provost, plus all the vice chancellors, it's a group of about 10 of us and, um, and others that we've deputized to listen in. We meet every morning from eight to 10. And that's been going on for several weeks now, even when we were in person. And then that meeting cascades to a meeting that our executive vice chancellor and provost then has with all of the deans. Those meetings are at 10 o'clock. Um, that allows us to stay aligned as you, as you asked. And the way in which we then cascade that down um, even in a remote environment, I then leave those meetings and convene meetings with our senior management team, our senior leadership team, which is a small group of four of us, and then they cascade down to their teams. So it's a lot of meetings. We always said our calendars were filled with meetings when we were in person. It feels like even more now, and we never even move from the screen. Uh, I. I also personally then have a, a meeting with my immediate staff that work in the suite in which I work so that they have an understanding. One of them is on a meeting of another 20 or so people from around the campus that convene each morning to talk about um, all the different inputs from various parts of the campus that need to be fed into the communications area. And it's just so much, um, so many meetings that allow us to stay connected, stay aligned, as you said. But, you know, I want to go back to the title of this, of this conversation about making relationships matter. You know, whether it's external or internal, the work that we do in advancement is all about building relationships. That strength is, should be front and center in everything and every way we're thinking about the work that we do right now. Um, so let's, yeah, so let's turn to those external okay. relationships for a minute. Uh, as you look at both your alumni engagement challenges and your fundraising challenges across UCLA's many constituencies, how do you approach this? How have your colleagues looked at this as you've talked with one another? 
Well, we've just been saying that this is the moment to be in touch with as many people that matter to our institution as possible. And just because we're not going to be doing face-to-face -face visits and just because um, we can't dine out to convene with our volunteers and our alumni and our donors, this is exactly the time when people welcome the call. Um, there are so many phone calls being made, just checking in, making sure people are doing well, feeling good, finding out if they need anything, uh, making sure they have family supports, particularly our older donors and alumni. And every single one of those calls has been met with such warmth on the other end. People are craving the need to connect. And our philosophy is if we're with people in a moment like this, they will be with us when we come out on the other end of it. So there's nothing that should change in the way we think about how we engage our donors. We just need to be in that conversation. Don't let it drop, stay connected, because that's what everybody's craving right now. So this raises the question then, are you still soliciting as an organization? At what levels? How do you approach the challenge of uh, not appearing to be tone deaf, even as many of your constituents are feeling a deep sense of anxiety about the present and about the future? What guidance have you given your various staff in navigating these challenges? Well, we've, we've obviously led with the need to project both clarity and confidence in where the university is at this point, what it's doing and how it's leading, particularly in the healthcare space, but in, but in really every way that the institution has chosen to make its decisions. And we've been sharing that all along the way with our volunteers. But from a fundraising perspective, you know, it's dairy. The telemarketing activity, that's quiet. Um, we're not doing that right now. Uh, those kinds of phone calls are intrusive and uh, people don't need to be asked in quite in that way. However, the crowdfunding activity, we have our own crowdfunding platform, that's really energetic. And we've put out a variety of messages, which we can talk about in a second, um, to stimulate activity on those sites. Um, in, in key areas, we've, we've been having conversation about um, large major gift conversations that we wanna maintain. There are reasons for those conversations to continue with the same fervor that they were leading up to this moment. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of activity on the foundation, corporate and foundation side, organizations that, uh, corporations that really wanna step up and help in the healthcare space especially, but also foundations that are banding together across the country and wanting to make big commitments. Um, I also don't wanna overlook the importance of our alumni affairs activity. It's not just about the fundraising, but it's how do we build community online and in spaces where we're not seeing people day to day. We had to cancel all sorts of events, but our alumni team that staged a virtual alumni day a year and a half ago um, really has the tools and the capability to step up and immediately start to move those programs online as well. Um, we have an online career platform. We keep thinking about how are we going to serve a graduating class of 2020 that's going to enter the world in a very different way. And so we're trying to activate all of those kinds of things and animate them in this other space. But we're being really, really sensitive to tone. There was a time when our messages were all about an abundance of caution. And then we had to change those because I said, we, we've got to sound more resolute. We understand that these events aren't going to take place. Our campaign celebration, and you mentioned the success of our campaign, that, was, that celebration was set for May 14th. That's off the table. We'll postpone it to a date we can't even figure out when. But we will, we will postpone it and we'll come together eventually. But um, well, we're talk doing our more. very best to, yeah. to speak to the anxiety of the moment and to provide clarity and confidence and to have the institution be at the center and a resource for people. Yeah. So as you talk about this kind of tone that you're trying to strike, Rhea, and the messaging that has evolved over the last two weeks, um, how much have you chosen to focus or to, or to place a focus on 
COVID-19 research or medical response, which clearly UCLA is deeply engaged with, as opposed to the impact that it's having on UCLA undergraduates, for example, for the university's employee families. How, how has the message uh, began to evolve for you and how are you constructing it? So we have um, effectively two focal points right now, and that's our students and patient care and, and medical research. So if we, if we look at it, we're, we're leading all of our main websites for uh, our advancement work really has a, a front and center banner that talks about, as it does for the university, but a front and center banner about the crisis. Um, we have four core funds that we're soliciting for. Two are for students, a, a Bruin Tech Fund that is really to help provide the resources for technology for so many of our students who rely on those uh, resources when they're on campus but don't have at home. So that was an appeal that went out right away from our Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education and we're uh, providing grants to students to, to have the Wi-Fi or the, the laptops to be able to work from home. Our spring quarter starts on Monday. So that was an urgent need. We often ha also have an economic crisis fund that was in existence already that we're now promoting through our Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. On the medical side, we have two funds, um, one for research and uh, medical research and education, and then another for patient care. And they're large unrestricted funds, but there is a separate page for that. We're doing, um, we've mobilized around those four things, but. So you've created actual landing pages. Absolutely. In your, um, uh, uh, yes. across your platforms. Okay. Yes. Yes. Great. Um, let us just turn for a moment uh, with the little time that we have left, Rhea, to ask you the question, are there any silver linings here as we face the challenges we face? Are there things that you believe we might achieve as advancement professionals because we've seized upon this crisis almost as an opportunity to get better at what we do as advancement professionals? You've hinted at a few things, but are there things that you would call out explicitly? Well, I guess what I would say is that, you know, we, because we are in the relationship business, um, we're reminded that we're good at this. Um, we should always lead with our strengths. And I think that the clarity and focus that's required in a moment like this, that's what crisis demands of us, to be really clear and focused on what's truly important. Um, we can hold on to that when we come out of this. I think we, we get a lot better at what we do. Um, I think the care for our communities, both internally and externally, is really, really important. Understanding that people are working in, in a really challenging time, personally and professionally, and to be able to provide the opportunities to build resilience. Um, our alumni team did a great online program around mindfulness for alumni and faculty, staff, anybody could, could join in, um, really taking care of one another and our constituents is something that I think is, is, will stick with us, should stick with us. Um, and to remember that we've been through other forms of crisis. This is unprecedented. We don't know what's going to happen with the economy, uh, but, but my new mantra has been that in this crisis, in this health crisis, that we need to redefine what it means to be positive by staying positive. And I think that if we do that and we stay connected at a time when people are craving connection and compassion, that we will all be better positioned when we come out at the other end of this um, with deeper relationships, better understandings of our colleagues, seeing people in their homes with their pets, with their kids, um, really deepens our internal relationships as well. And I think that's super important. So, so, one, so one final question, Rhea. Yeah. As you look toward the coming weeks, what are the most likely challenges that you believe we will all face in the coming weeks and, and, and what you will likely see at UCLA? 
So I, I have to say, I think that these, watching them roll across the country, these stay at home orders, um, I suspect they're going to last longer than our leaders rightfully uh, say, at least to start. Um, I, I, think, I think we're gonna be physically distancing ourselves from one another for a little bit longer. Our, our safer at home orders go through April 19th. And I think we have to be realistic that that could extend. I think that we honestly need to be very thoughtful about the gift conversations and the volunteer conversations that we're having that, that continue to provide the same regularity and routine cadence that people are accustomed to. I think it's super important that we try and stick to the routines that people come to expect. We're convening an all, all staff town hall next Thursday. Individual teams have been working and having forums with you know, groups. I did one with our health sciences team yesterday with I think 60 or 70 people on the phone. But in each, each particular area, the more that we can stay connected to one another, because I think this is going to last a bit longer and we're gonna to have to figure out how to how to get even more refined in the way in which we work, you know, and, and develop greater clarity and focus uh, if this is gonna continue. Yeah. Well, Rhea, at last our time is up, but I wanna thank you very much for sharing all of this with us. I believe indeed uh, it, enormously beneficial to colleagues in the profession. So thank you for being with us here this You're morning. welcome. I am happy to answer questions over the course of the next few days. And uh, I just want to say to everyone listening, um, I hope you all are, uh, no matter what kind of organization you're with, you all recognize that each of us has assets and experts to help. It may not be healthcare. It may be the arts. You know, the healing benefit of the arts is so powerful. It may be in helping people build resiliency. It may be uh, any number of ways that you can think creatively about what your organization provides its constituents and double down on that because, as I said, people are craving that connection and our ability to deliver on that, I think is going to be one of the most important things we can do for each other and, and for those who depend on us for the, for the uh, programs that we provide. So it's a pleasure to do this. Thank you. Stay Thank well, stay healthy, and stay connected. Thank you, Rhea. Uh, we here at uh, GGNA want to thank all of you for being with us here today and trust that this was helpful to you in your work. We, as we said, will post a recording of today's webinar early next week. We welcome, uh, Rhea welcomes your questions, and we will try to get all the questions and answers out there over a period of time. Um, please also stay tuned for additional content and webinars as we continue the series, Fundraising in a Public Health Crisis. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, it has been, in fact, uh, our extraordinary pleasure to have you with us. Thank you again, Rhea. Thank you.